So how many of you think that we need more women in office? <laughs> and how many of you think that women might make better leaders than men? <laughs> and how many of you think that you'll be running for office of those who raise your hands before you're 30? <laughs> Only, how many is that? Three? Men and women are both more likely to say running for office is something they would absolutely never do, right? Uh, but women, 40, over 40% 40 of the potential candidates we surveyed in 2011, these are the people that are well suited, you know, school principals and business executives and lawyers, 41% uh, of women said that they are, you know, would never run for, that's, run for office, that's something they would never do, right? And that was up from 2001 by about 10 points. Women in particular think that you need, they tend to overvalue the qualifications you need to run for office. And they tend to undervalue their own qualifications. And we see this all the time with the young women we serve, and even with adult women, I saw it at Emerge, that people think you need to have like three law, you know, a law degree and three PhDs so, to run for school board or city council. And in fact, if only. <laughs> Being in Congress is a very hard job. It's a very hard job, and particularly for someone with children and young young children. Um, I don't know how people like Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Kirsten Gillibrand and Linda Sanchez do it, but they do do it because they consider the the um, the rewards, the psychic rewards, to be that significant. If you do try to incorporate a, a career, a political career with a family, um, is it, is it going to be convenient? Probably not. Is it going to be something that allows you to be the best that you possibly can be in, in, in all areas? I think we do push ourselves to do just that. Is it hard? Absolutely. My dad used to always say, Tiffany, if you want something that you've never had before, you're gonna have to do something that you've never done before in order to get it. So yes, I think that tapping into the ingenuity and the talent and the resources and the brain of half of our population for the first time in order for us to achieve a different reality, yeah, I think it's, I think it's an experiment worth trying. <laughs> Growing up in the 1980s, I grew up much differently than my mother or grandmother's generations. And although I feel very lucky to have grown up in the United States, I still don't understand why there aren't more women in political office. After all, this is the 21st century. I think many people are surprised when they find out that the United States is not a leader in women's representation. We, we, we here in the U.S. tend to think about the U.S. as leading the world in just about everything. Right? We have this huge economy, we win the most um, you know, gold medals at the Olympics, but when it comes to women in politics, we are not at the leader of the pack at all. Um, instead, we fall just about in the middle. Um, if you look at the rankings in terms of women in national legislatures, so the equivalent of U.S. Congress, the, U the United States ranks 97th out of um, almost 190 countries. So that puts us right behind Morocco and Venezuela, um, behind Iraq and Afghanistan, which you may not expect, um, but really right smack in the middle. When Condoleezza Rice was, uh, you've heard this before, negotiating the governments in Afghanistan and Iraq, the structure of those parliaments, she was insisting on 25% women, you know, that there were thresholds. We don't have that, right? I mean, but yet there's no outcry in this country to have sort of greater inclusion of women in top elected positions. Hey, 
Why do you think we lack women leaders in politics today? I think it's just holdovers of sort of an antiquated thought about the uh, the role of women and the role of men in general uh, that definitely transfers to politics. Because of men. <laughs> <laughs> Men do not want to be told what to do by a woman, my opinion. You know, the Founding Fathers, all male, you know, so I think that's still obviously part of it. The feminist movement of the second half of the 21st century led to many gains for women. But the amount of women holding political office is still extremely low. Even though more women have entered the workforce and are working in positions previously dominated by men. The first woman wasn't elected in her own right in the United States, in the United States Senate until 1978, right? Really, it was not long ago, right? So probably it was just an, it was just anathema to whatever happened. It just was not something that would normally happen. Now, of course, that is a form of discrimination, assuming, stereotyping people into their roles and assuming that they could only do those. Men could do these roles, women could do those roles. You know, that is a form of discrimination. But now breaking through, we studied, there's tremendous research about whether women can raise as much money as men, whether they get the same number of votes as men, whether they're as likely to win when they do run. And all of those suggest there's no broad discrimination against women anymore, right? Um, broad, intentional discrimination. Now, we've found that women are a little less likely to be recruited sometimes. Like I was mentioning party officials, they're less likely to have people suggest to them that they run for office, even their family and friends, right? So that, but we would say that's probably the vestiges of traditional gender socialization still playing out and still very present in our lives and politics. I think that younger women really take for granted the, the gains that have been made in such a relatively short period of time and that it's really important for them to look back and see what it was like when you opened, if you needed or wanted a job, you had to go to the help wanted female sector of the population. When contrary to myth, homemakers were not better off than they are today. They had almost no rights. There were only eight states where they had any legal claim on their husband's property. There were head and master laws. Young women just don't even know that, that said that the man had the right to determine the residence. And if he decided to move and you didn't follow him, he could actually charge you with desertion. So these sorts of things, I find that they stun young women. And it's a measure of how far we've come that it feels to them, it's like medieval history. And yet it's really important for them to understand that it's not medieval history. It was less than 50 years ago. True, young women today have more options than they did 50 years ago. Yet they still don't want to be our nation's leaders which means the voice and experience of over half of our population still remains absent from making the decisions that matter most. I feel like I got involved with politics from birth. I was born to parents who moved to Los Angeles to actually join the Black Panther Party and they named me after the prison in upstate New York because I was born a couple of months after the riots there. So I was really born into politics. And I've always done human rights or social justice work, done work with labor unions, activism work, and that just was a natural fit with uh, political aspirations and interests. So um, after our chief speaks, we are going to have you all stand up and you're gonna hold it. Gender is definitely a challenge to running for office. I look at Louisville Metro Council where I serve as a council person and of the 26 council people, you literally have a handful of us who are women, I mean less than half. And so that says to me that one, women are not being encouraged to run. Two, I know from my own experience that I have people ask me questions like, oh, you're a mom with two kids. How are you gonna juggle all of that? Well, how do the men do it? Because they're fathers of children as well, but they get to run for office and that's okay and expected. So there are different expectations of us. People look at us differently. I even feel like people criticize us more as women for the decisions that we make or what we do to lead. You know, most people who become a con member of Congress or a senator, they start out as a city council or a state, le local part-time state legislator, right? Mm -hmm. So we're looking broadly about what makes women more likely, or why don't women start that path, that career ladder path? You know, 70% of people in the U.S. Congress held an, another elected position first. So for women to become sort of much more likely to become equally elected in the, you know, in the elected positions, 
the baseline level of interest in running has to be become equal with men. So that one's a much harder one to figure out how to close. Uh, now whether or not that sort of gap in sort of your belief in your skills is happening early on, we might, might be happening very early on. It might be that women aren't socialized to think about politics. Uh, it might be that women are sort of socialized to be more private than men are or, or less entrepreneurial. But that, that one's harder to figure out how to, how to sort of close that gap. And until we close that gap where men and women are just equally comfortable thinking, yeah, I might run for Congress someday, you know, we're, we're going to have disparities into the foreseeable future. Organizations across the country have been working for decades to recruit women to run for office. But it is only recently that studies have found that perhaps political ambition starts much earlier than we originally thought. We've just done an exhaustive study of all surveys of adolescents and high school students and, and nobody's ever asked specifically about interest in running for office when they grow up, right? They've asked about sort of other professions. And in that case, men are only a little bit more likely to say they want to be lawyers or business leaders or things like that, the kinds of professions that lead to politics. So, uh, but, but politics hasn't been studied exactly, specifically among the, the adolescent or high school age group. So your question was, where does it come from or where does it start? No? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's probably starting with the families. I don't know. I mean, Boys and girls, I don't know any parents would know this, boys and girls seem to have very different interests when they're little. Um, I don't know if the princess craze is, in their modern, modern era has driven sort of made women, girls, less likely to think about sort of leadership and public service. Uh, but again, there is no great research on sort of political ambition among young people. Although we argue in our work that really there's, it needs to be in place early. People just often, many people just don't decide as an adult to run for office. It's, for most people, it's been something that's been in their head. They, maybe they ran as a high school student for student council. And, it, and so ultimately, that they've always been thinking about it. Running Star is an organization that works with young women, high school, college, young professional women, and encourages them, encourages them to actually get into politics and run for office. I spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill lobbying the people in power. And I would come back and I would have lunch with the other young women associates and we all would talk about how there were no women like us who were in those positions of power. And so that's why in 2007 I founded Running Start because what we really needed was to get that message to younger women so that they would grow up thinking, you know, when they dream about what they want to be, that being a member of Congress, you know, even being a school board member or being president of the United States becomes one of the things that they dream about. So what have you all been doing for the last few days and why are you here? Um, we learned a lot about networking and we networked with each other and we passed around business cards and we learned how to talk, meet new people and talk to new people. Um, my favorite part has been learning about the, the different skills that we need to succeed in business and in politics and I think it's really important because as w young women we need to learn these skills early so that we can, um, we can excel because a lot of times the, the people who really get far are the people who start early and that's something that we're trying to instill in all of us and we're trying to learn. So. Ignite serves largely low-income young women and we're community-based and meaning we actually uh, reach the women in schools and colleges and nonprofits. Um, and the reason we do that is because we want to cast a really broad net, not a lot of, there are a couple programs that serve young women, women in high school and college, but they tend to be um, residential and kind of short in nature and they cost. And so you really are reaching kind of a, a very select group of young women. And we wanted to make sure to cast the net as broadly and widely as possible so that we can reach women who, um, you know, who might not apply for a residential program, who might not even be able to apply for a residential program. But not have skits. And you definitely have like the definition, what is dating violence, the phases of it, and what are... You know, we have high school students and we have college students, so it's really different for that, for those groups. I'd say with high school students, they just don't know anything. <laughs> um, so it's just kind of a, you know, the, the thing we hear the most from them is, you know, there's so many problems in my community and I want to fix them, but I just don't even know where to begin. Um, the college students come in uh, with more information and they know a lot more about, about the structure of government. Um, but they sort of, the thing I see the most with the college students is that they want to do something, but they're more comfortable being behind the scenes. 
than they are being out in front. And so I'll have college students say, yeah, I'm really interested in you know political leadership, but I see myself as a chief of staff or I see myself you know, running campaigns. Um, and there's something deeply uncomfortable for them about envisioning themselves as the person in the front for whom everyone else is working. Well, for a career, I don't want to have to do anything with politics. Um, because I think, for one point, um, I don't think I could make it that high. Why don't you think you could make it up that high? Well, because, I don't know, I'm just not confident. I just, like, I see myself more as, like, a doctor. Like, I don't, just I just don't think of, like, me ever being able to make it up that high. You ask a man, oh, well, could you, are you qualified to be in Congress? They'd say, many, of course, sure, I could do that. You know, I choose not to, but I could do that, where women have not, sort of don't have that comfort. Now, maybe this is something that will evaporate over time. It didn't evaporate in our 10 years between our two surveys, right, where women just begin to more heavily in inhabit sort of the top rungs of business and law and at universities and, and organizations, political organizations that they'll just become more comfortable sort of being glibly ambitious, right? Now, I don't know if that would be an improvement. Something we did know is that women actually are much more thoughtful in how they think about whether they're qualified. They like think, we ask them, well, what skills do you need to be a politician or to be a high-level elected official? And they say, well, you need A, B, C, and D. You need to be a good public speaker. You need to have knowledge about public policy issues. You need to have some experience campaigning and running for office. Men would be more likely to say they didn't need those things. They could just do it, right? Now maybe so the women are actually being more responsible and thoughtful about how, you know, sort of whether or not they're ready to be in office or ready to run for office. So it might speak to sort of a, just a, a, the sort of gendered way we raise people and sort of the levels of sort of ease and comfort with which men and women think they can do things, right? Do you think boys have it easier? Um, boys just have more confidence at times and I don't know if that's innately or if it's because of like the world but like the way the society is but like Rachel said boys are always more often think like I'm the best I can do it like I can win rather than girls. Uh, running for office is a dog's life. I know that I ran again for Congress in 1970 and um, I they had redistricted me, and I had 15 counties. And uh, running for office is a dog's life. What you got to put up with, the miles you have to travel, the people you have to be nice to, uh, it, it's endless, the, the, the calls you have to answer. And there are simply fewer women, proportionately, who want that. And then you have to be away from home. And uh, you'll never have as many women as men who want to, uh, want to do that. And uh, so uh, they, they say it's discrimination, but it's not. It's the choice of women who just don't, don't want to play that role. Every time people try to do gender difference or sex difference research and say, well, here are the mean differences between males and females, and isn't this interesting? If you compare that to arbitrary difference between individuals, say the difference between you and I, who are of the same sex, our difference is going to be bigger than that average difference between males and females. So they're not as big. You know, we make them bigger than they are. I do really think that that's the case, that if we provide the opportunities, we encourage the open thinking that, um, that males are given in female populations and young females will get the same kind of experience, will get the same confidence, will get the same self-esteem, will get the same willingness to take risks, right? These are things from the moment you learn that an infant is one sex or another, people's attitudes change, right? Little girls get hugged, held close, we use parentees with them, beep, 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 so sweet. Little boys, we sort of sock them on the arm and you know, we get excited when they cry or express anger because we're like, that's strong. You know, little girls, if they cry or express anger, we treat it as 
this sort of vulnerability and, and, and that interaction, that social input is just extraordinarily powerful. It defines how they grow. Well, I don't think that there are any inherent differences between men and women. Men can be uh, just as nurturing and warm as women, and we've seen this, and women can be just as ruthless uh, and macho <laughs> as uh, the Terminator, you know? Um, however, because we've had different experiences, uh, right from the very beginning, uh, we know that um, parents treat their daughters and their sons differently. They encourage the boys to explore more than they do the girls. But they encourage the girls to read emotions better. And from the very earliest socialization, uh, women are more attuned to caretaking relationships, juggling men. Uh, to multitasking in a different way than men do, uh, to actually uh, tending to people's needs and at the same time thinking ahead of other needs that need to be done. Uh, so they bring those, those skills. I don't think they're intrinsic. I don't think every woman has them. Uh, I think men can and are learning them. But meanwhile, as long as we play such very different roles, uh, women will bring extra insight that is important to balance the extra insight that men bring. Historically, women have always been the primary caregivers, and much of this hasn't changed even as women have entered the workforce. In fact, in the summer of 2012, Anne-Marie Slaughter, former director of policy planning at the U.S. State Department, wrote an article that appeared in The Atlantic titled, Why Women Still Can't Have It All where she described her difficulties with balancing her high-profile position with her family obligations, an issue that many women still struggle with today, no matter the age. We, we want to be involved, we just don't like all the stress we'll have because then, like, if we do get to if we do get to have a family and we'd want to raise that family, I think it'd be way too much stress having to go late nights in the office and trying to like pass laws and stuff like that, I think it just wouldn't work out with the family. And the women that you all have spoken to, leaders, have they talked a lot about that kind of work family balance and being stressed? Or how do you all, how do you know it would be stressful? Well, I don't think they've talked about that they've been stressed. I think that we just feel it because like, we're here in school and we have homework and all, and like we have tests coming up and just like with all that we feel stressed and imagine with a lot more when it has to do with like your job or like life or death or something. It's, I think it's, yeah, it's too much. The family role stuff is real. It's real. <laughs> It's real on the end where you're parenting, and then it's real on the other side when you're dealing with elders. And so um, my message to a lot of the young women that we see is don't just wait until you get to that place where you feel comfortable and ready to run, because by the time you get there, you're going to have all those family roles. And so, you know, for a local office, you do not need to be... 45 years old with a huge career behind you. You can actually run for city council and sit on city council in your 20s. And there's no reason not to, you know? Um, and so when once, you, once you've held that first office, you know, go ahead, have a bunch of kids. You know, you can do it in office. It's just a whole lot harder to do it once you have the children. And I'm not saying it's impossible. I would never suggest that anyone should delay childbearing. <laughs> but I do encourage them to start thinking about it earlier. I, I went to this one particular party committee and I talked to the head of coalitions who does the work with the candidates in recruitment. And he said to me, what do I tell these voters when they're asking what am I supposed to do to support a young woman running for office? She's supposed to be home with her kids. And that was actually a conversation I was having in 2010, 2011, even today. And this is still an issue. We still have this dynamic where young women are not seen as leaders in a lot of professions, particularly in politics, it's so public. And we have to get more young women to become those leaders, to be A, role models, but B, really change the dynamic for people to see that young women are able to do these things and they need to be part of these conversations. They need to be at the table making policy. They need to be discussing what their lives are like. Well, I think that, um, well, we talked about this a lot, but childbearing and having a family is a huge barrier for women as 
um, not only politicians but any job that you might want to pursue because like for a man you can have children but you don't physically get pregnant and have to give birth and that for a woman that takes time like you can't be in the office when you're giving birth to a child and that's just the reality it has nothing to do with whether you want to be a stay-at-home mom like how long you want to stay home with your kids you still there is going to be a time if you're planning on having a child where you're going to have to be home with that child even if it's only like you know, under a month, and I know that I do want to have children, but I also do want to be in politics, and I think that's going to be a hard thing because you want to be involved in your child's life and you want to be able to, you know, have children and not, and even if you're like adopting children or whatever, you still, it involves like a lot of time and it's hard to be able to balance that. And I mean, it's hard for men too to have a family, but there definitely is a physical aspect of it that makes it challenging for women to start at such a young age. It's still very much the case that for many, many women, uh, if they go to work every day instead of staying at home with their young children, that they feel like they're being bad mothers. And this adds to that feeling of stress. Uh, there are many, many fathers out there who feel that if they uh, are at home with their children and if they're making decisions that impact or, or that they believe will impact their long-term career prospects, they feel that they're being bad fathers, and this adds to these feelings of stress. So even in extremely egalitarian families, you have the ghost of the traditional family, and that ghost haunts these families and makes them for, sort of very nervous. You know, these are like chains rattling in the attic. Um, and they wonder, they're plagued with doubt. They wonder if they're being good parents because they're not parenting the way their parents did. I was elected the chair of the Kansas Republican Party two and a half years ago uh, and re-elected this past January, so I'm in my second term. And, uh, and I've been involved in Kansas politics and politics in a lot of states, but in Kansas politics for the last 15 years. Um, and I actually got my start with Sam Brownback, who was a senator, had just filled the seat um, that Bob Dole had vacated. Um, and now um, have moved from having been a junior staff member working with him to being his partner now that he's governor. Kansas is, as most would know, definitely a center-right state. Um, it's, it's shifted back and forth um, over a period of time. I think most people would call it a very Republican state in general, um, but certainly we've got a, a very conservative govern governor right now, so there's been a really good positive shift in that direction. I think that women are now in a position where we can define things within our life the way that we want. Um, we can value family and put an emphasis on it and still be a successful executive um, or a th thriving philanthropic leader who's out doing lots of things for the community. And I think to a certain degree that men's attitudes have changed as, as well. I mean, my husband comes from a, uh, a, a family of very strong men, many of whom were career, mil career military. And um, I, I think that one of the things that drew, drew him to me when we were in college is that I was very independent, uh, was focused on a path, uh, focused on things that are higher and more important than self, and, um, and really wanted to do things that were meaningful in life. And that's what drives us more than anything else. And the rest of it, the way that we work out our family, um, just follows. You know, there's no such thing as all or nothing. And in this world that we live in that ha is, is overwhelmed by shades of gray, we can't say to ourselves, do I want a family or do I want a career? You can have both. In fact, if you get married, your husband can help you out. And in the economy that we're in today, it's actually probably going to, if you have a husband or if you get married or have a spouse, um, you will probably have to balance those duties anyways. So the old traditional ways of raising your children I don't think they exist today. And while I respect Anne Marie Louise Slaughter, and I think she's a genius, I think that her observations are a reflection of her generation and our generation. It just served as a fear mechanism for our generation. Perhaps the struggles with balancing work and family will never fully go away. But there are ways to make the balance easier for both men and women, like perhaps electing more women. Do you think things would be different if more women were in charge of our I really do. And how would they be different? Better. Everything would be better. Uh, everything is 
based on how a man sees things. Women are more nurturing and caring and that things would be better if it was a woman. More fair. That's in politics, said, yeah. yeah. A lot of the, the issues that we face are not necessarily distinguishable on a gender basis, but they impact, they tend to impact women uh, differently than men. And so the, the ability to have people with bringing those perspectives to Congress is, is really important. The issue of daycare, for instance, is one that uh, most men don't really have to consider during their, uh, their lives. And certainly if they don't get married, they, they never have to consider it at all. But uh, most women have to deal with, those, with that issue at one point or another. The whole issue of reproductive health is clearly one that uh, is, is uh, something that more women are concerned about than men. Well, there's a lot of research that shows that when women are elected to office, they will do things differently, right? They will prioritize issues that are often you know, associated with women like education, um, sexual harassment laws, and sort of do things that have been perhaps ignored in traditionally male organizations like male legislatures. So they will push some alternative uh, legislative agenda. So not to have them in there then, to doing that would seem like our, our, the representation we're getting is not accurate, right? It's not fair. There's also been research that suggests that you know, women mayors or women state legislators or women in Congress actually have different styles of leadership, right? That they tend to be more inclusive, they tend to be more willing to compromise. Um, we haven't had any great studies lately that show that, and partisanship may have wiped out some of this, right? If you have to toe your party's line to keep your job, you do that instead of sort of being more open and compromising. So there is lots of evidence that suggests women would do the job differently. There's also just the mere symbolic value or, you know, does a government have legitimacy when you have 52 or 3 percent of the population are women, yet, you know, 15 percent of your national legislative body is women? Does that government have legitimacy? What's going on there? That doesn't make sense. We could also say that's true for certain races as well. I absolutely think that politics would change if there was a greater distribution of sexes in positions of power. At, at the most basic level, it would shift the trajectory of future generations, right? If that's what's modeled, like, look, the people who make decisions are equally distributed across males and females, then young girls who are interested in politics are going to go, oh, that's a place I can go. I, that, I, I, I am drawn to that. That really moves me. That's where I want to be. I see that as possible. Um, whether there's going to be a big difference in policy at the level of more conservative versus more liberal or more progressive versus more traditional approaches, I, I can't really make a, a, a good prediction in that regard. I mean, a lot of the most outspoken, well-known, highly conservative, non-progressive figures are female. And I put the state government's checkbook online for all to see. In 2008, Republican Sarah Palin became the first woman chosen to run on her party's ticket as vice president. She was a new kind of female politician. And the media loved her. came with the office. I put it on eBay. So especially when you're thinking about what, what a woman would do, the question is, well, which women are you talking about? And I think that's even going to be more the case as we see more conservative women enter, right? Because is the expectation that women are gonna enter and immediately turn to maybe traditional women's issues like reproductive rights? Well, probably not, because when it comes to reproductive rights, women actually disagree with themselves more than they disagree with men. Right? So we can't assume that women are going to focus on any particular issue or that they're going to have any particular stance on a given issue. But I don't think there's a problem with that because I think that women should be there, they should be represented in politics regardless of what their positions or interests might be. I know some act, liberal activists who want more women to run, but you know they'll take a, a male liberal over a female conservative. But if you really, we have a two-party system, we're going to have a two-party system for the foreseeable future. If you believe in gender equality, then you have to have women in half the positions of both parties, right? I mean, otherwise, if you really think that the only legitimate system is one that begins to approximate what the citizenship looks like, you know, half men, half women, or even slightly more women than men, 
then you know they have men, women, and men have to become equally represented in both parties. Historically, women have been overrepresented on the left at both the federal and state levels, although this varies widely from state to state. Now, the good news for women is that when women typically run, they do pretty well. It's getting women to, to run in the first place. And so I think that more traditional cultures, it's you know maybe still less accepted that women take on that role of, of being candidates, um, as opposed to states that are more progressive you tend to have uh, women who have been active in, in, in many ways and often have the careers that lead into these sorts of issues, right? Uh, they're different. There are certainly people who are elected to state legislatures, excuse me, they tend to kind of have more professional backgrounds. Uh, they're business owners, they're lawyers, um, some, some educators, but there's often a correlation between education level and running for office. And so, uh, not surprisingly, in states where women are a bigger part of the workforce, they tend to be more involved in, in the professional workforce, they tend to run for office more than, than other states. Colorado ranks highest as the state with the most women representing its constituents in state office. It is also considered one of the healthiest states and ranks as one of the best states to live in if you're a woman due to high commencement, economic success, and access to full health care. Kentucky, on the other hand, has a low number of women serving in state office and ranks as one of the top five worst states to live in if you're a woman due to high poverty, low education, and a lack of freedom of choice. There is no substantial evidence that each of these states' rankings are due to the number of women they have serving in office, but one can't help but believe that women do make a difference. What I've seen at the state level is that there is more of an interest in cutting social services because those are often seen as services that women benefit from or children benefit from and so it's easier to cut those services than it is to cut services that may be more male-dominated industries. It's easier to cut education and health care because we have more women who are teachers so it's um, that gets sliced before anything else and part of that is because our legislature in Kentucky is male-dominated. There are more men in our state legislature than women, and we need to do a better job of making sure we prepare women to serve. What I've seen on the local level in Louisville, Kentucky, with Metro Council, is that the same thing happens. So, for example, when we were arguing in Kentucky about the hospital merger between um, public and private hospital entities, more and more women were speaking out because those were our services that were going to be cut, and then the men were pretty much saying, hey, you know, let's do it. It's you know, corporations, we want to look out for corporations over people. And as women, we were saying, no, we want to look out for people over corporations. It's about people, not profits. And those messages were very difficult to get across because we were talking to a room full of men who were, at the end of the day, going to make a decision about our health and our bodies. It's definitely a long district, to, you know, to travel. That's for sure. <laughs> And I felt it today, in one day, just going to every single um, polling place that I could get to. <laughs> Go Tiff! Woo! Uh, you know, supporting Attica is easy um, because she shares my same values. She believes in fairness for all people. Um, and uh, she's one of the fiercest human rights activists I know. Um, and I think for Louisville and the challenges that we're facing, um, challenges specifically in Attica's district, um, we need somebody who, who has a lot of experience standing up for people, um, and Attica's dedicated her entire life to that. Yeah. Who'd you vote for? <laughs> Attica Scott from Metro Council District <laughs> 1. <laughs> it takes a lot to run for office. Money, time, and support. But there is no reason women aren't just as capable as men when it comes to leading our states or our country. I'm fully confident in women's ability to lead any political entity and certainly to be Speaker of the House, to be President of the United States. And we've seen clearly their ability to serve on the Supreme Court and in many other capacities. So I think as time goes on, more women uh, in, in government will be a plus for the country, and I think we will see more women in government. 
Well, thank you and good morning. I, uh, I was listening to the Congresswoman's remarks and uh, she made the comment, you know, kind of the Nike, just do it type of a, of a theme when you're thinking about uh, a future in, in any kind of politics, whether it's here in Washington, D.C. at the congressional level or whether it's within your local community at the school board, the PTA, or the city council. It is a matter of just doing it. Kirsten Gillibrand talks about when she was in the House, when she was on the Armed Services Committee, she, at, the po at that point, was one of only a couple women on that committee. And when Speaker Pelosi came into office at that point, she decided to double the number, or I think she brought in like, six women onto that committee. And the Congresswoman Gillibrand, at the time the Congresswoman said, I really felt the difference in the dialogue. So we were talking about the war in Afghanistan and, and Iraq at that point. Instead of talking about what kind of guns we had and what kind of tanks we had only, we were talking about how are our troops prepared before they go? How are our military families going to be supported while we're gone? How are we going to deal with the troops after? So the conversation changes. And so I think the most important, the most important piece isn't that women are better leaders than men, it's that both perspectives need to be shared and that we're going to be making better decisions when that happens. And so I see the dialogue changing and I'm that's that's one of the big pieces the perspective. But the other piece is the role model piece. You just don't that I cannot underestimate the power and the, the undervalue if you will the the value of role models and in 2009 actually with Running Start we had 30,000 high school girls apply to our 50 spot program. And that, to me, was an indication that when we had, sec you know, Senator, at the time, Senator Obama, Secretary Clinton, and um, even Sarah Palin running for office, they saw different people running for office. They looked different. They didn't look the same that young women had seen. And they thought, hey, this is a place for me, and why don't I try this out? So I think we just tend to undervalue the role model piece, and that's, that's one of the things I definitely am seeing shift when you have more of a critical mass of women here in Washington. So I just graduated from high school and I'm managing uh, this woman's campaign. I worked for her as an intern uh, last year in a special election. She actually ran and won uh, as an independent, which is really rare um, everywhere. And in Missouri, she was the only independent in the house. Um, and so I'm managing her campaign this summer uh, and then I'll be going to Wellesley um, in the fall. Hopefully to study public policy, but we'll see. Um, yeah, before I worked for her, I would I would have said I would never run for office, but um, she changed my mind, and the progressive women that are a part of her community changed my mind because I, I see how hard they work um, in the state house and for the things that they care about, and I think it really does make a significant difference in the way that we talk about things in Missouri. I think a lot of them came to the program not really understanding or not really feeling confident enough to feel like they could take on a leadership role. Um, and then as they've seen women of color come to our school and come to talk to them about, this is my experience, this is how I'm in politics now, or this is how I'm serving as your city council person, that's amazing. And so just being able to hear that and then at the conference being able to see like literally a sea of women who have experienced all of these things that they're you know really nervous about is empowering and so that's the big piece where they see it they hear it and now they're starting to really feel it so i feel like those are the big components that continue to keep them excited and engaged in the program so we're going to do the crossword for advisory. should hand those out. Should we print, should we get those printed out? Netsai is amazing. Um, I met Netsai as an eighth grader, um, and she was super bright, super excited to do all sorts of things. And then now she's a 10th grader, and it's crazy just to have seen her grow. Um, but she has this vision for the world of how she's going to see things change, and she's literally like thirsty for learning action steps and trying them out. So in, just I just want to go back to your question before about um, like the fact that um, I wouldn't want to be pres run for president or office. Um, is that because of all the stress or is it because I just don't think I'm capable of getting there? I just want to say that I feel like I am capable and I think that like, any, anyone who is very motivated and just 
puts in all like a lot of effort, I think that people can do it. If you really want something, work, work for it and you can achieve it. That's the way I think. Young women today are graduating at higher rates than men. They are striving to be doctors and lawyers, as well as teachers and mothers. And through organizations like Ignite and Running Start, they will begin to also strive to be our nation's leaders. Because in order to improve our nation, more women must be present at the decision-making table. So I think the, the evidence is the strongest um, that having women in power changes people's minds. It affects attitudes. It also affects the, the perceptions and attitudes of young girls. So the studies have consistently documented, both in the United States and around the world, the places that have more women in politics have young girls that aspire to political leadership. They espouse greater interest in politics. They know more about political leaders and political issues. So these things matter. Well, when I was growing up in the 1960s, there were not only no mentors, there were no role models. If you went to a movie, all the movies were about these male heroes. And the only time the male heroes got in trouble was when some stupid woman did something like say, oh, I dropped my shoe, let's go back for it. And so as a woman, you found yourself rooting against your own sex. I mean, this has been a tremendous change that young women, I think, really need to appreciate and how different it was when you had no role models, no mentors, and in fact there have been many studies that suggest that some of the earliest women who did make it were not good mentors because they had gone through such hardship themselves that they'd had to just sort of toughen themselves up. I think nowadays women are more supportive of, of other women and increasingly men are more supportive too. I mean what is interesting to me is to look at all the homes uh, uh, when my students get married, for example, uh, and I'll visit their homes, uh, the boys have exactly the same aspirations for their daughters that they do for their sons. And that makes a huge difference. It's not just female mentoring, but dads who have confidence in your abilities. That's really important for women. I felt the transition happening in the last year or two in terms of people, I mentioned this earlier, but we are talking to the White House about this issue. We are talking to very nationally connected people that we know, companies, there's a ton of companies that care about this work. And so I have seen a shift in terms of people's perception around why we need to get more young women engaged. So I can feel a momentum shift sort of happening and it's been seven years now we've been doing this. A, on the nonpartisan front, but B, on this need to get more diversity and more women involved in leadership, it's really taken off. So I, I, my sense is in the next couple of years, we'll really see a momentum shift. Uh, as I mentioned, we have more women running than we have before. And it's really a numbers issue in a lot of ways. It's getting women to see, get past a lot of their own concerns about it and also being encouraged. And so it's a whole confluence of different organizations. And we work with a whole cadre of other organizations around the country that are working to get more women supported to run. Can I have everybody's attention? I want to introduce to you not the Metro Council, selected by the Metro Council, mm, but the People's Metro Council. <laughs> Every single person in this room was part of the team. You knocked on doors, you talked to folks, I made phone calls, and I appreciate you from the depths of my heart. The turnout, the vote shows yes. that we are the People's Champions. Yes. We. I always remind people that the United States ranks very low when it comes to women's political leadership in particular, and that if there's anything I think we need to do, it's go over to some other country and get those women to come here and help us figure out how to start our own revolution. So um, I, I think, though, that despite that, the rest of the world looks to the United States for leadership on so many different levels and in so many different ways. And the truth of the matter is that the strength of our country really resides in our ability to integrate difference um, and to integrate different cultures and to integrate different perspectives. So it's really um, a testament to, I think, a misstep 
that when it comes to women's leadership, we haven't been able to realize that. But I also think that that's where most of the hope and that's where the opportunity lies. You know, in other countries, they've adopted things like quotas, all kinds of different policies and practices in order to really facilitate this process of getting women into leadership. And I actually still believe that America could be the one place in the world where we could arrive at it through the power of our work, um, our hope, our drive, our culture. I, I still believe that it's possible for us to do it. And I think that it would mean the world, of course, because once you've got people with different perspectives at the highest level leading, it will make an impact in the decisions that are being made. Like, the place where I live and, like, the school that I go to, no one really talks about politics. Like, we talk about them, but they're kind of taboo. Like, I'll say something and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, Parker, go do your own thing, you know, I understand, but we're done. And here, everyone's so, like, willing to learn and willing to share and really want to do something in life, but not just to be, uh, like, to have that job, but to make a difference. And I think that's, that's really special and great. When I was a child, I mean, like there was nothing greater you could do than become president of the United States, right? I think now you'd say that I don't think parents are advocating that to their children as much as they used to. So we need to return public service to an honorable profession. And then we really have to figure out what's going on early because our evidence suggests by the time women leave college, and then women, there's already this gap. So whether that's sort of talking about life goals differently, possible professions differently with men and women, watching how we socialize men and women sort of thinking about that in schools and in families early on, that's long term how we're going to begin to sort of wipe this out. All the studies show that when you add enough women to the mix in a political system or in an economic institution, you get a broader vision of what the possibilities are for all of the employees or the citizens involved. Who, who wants to be the future president of the United States? Specifically in 2040. <laughs> That's the year I'm running. Are you launching your campaign right now? Yeah, I actually have a ton of people that are going to vote for me. I've moved schools, so I have people from both my schools voting for me. <laughs> and you guys are all voting for me, right? Yeah, everyone keeps telling me they're going to vote for me. Yeah. I mean, I'll get you let's just be real. If, if multiple people are running in 2040, it's going to be a really tough call. Yeah. We're yeah. running We're start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we got to map it out. So, yeah, we got to work around. Yeah, I've had a lot of they're gonna vote for me, so the pressure's on, guys. It's gonna happen. It's been happening since I was like four. People have been yeah. like, you should be president. I'll be like, okay, vote for me. I'll be like, okay, says so my fourth grade teacher. My mom always told me that girls aren't um, as like willing to express like, oh, they're so good. Like, you know, I have leadership qualities. So I guess I'm sort of falling into the stereotype like that. But um, yeah, I definitely think I can do it, and I, I think anyone can do it. Like, when you think about it, we're all people. And so what makes one person, like why can't you do something? I've, I, I guess I've never understood why people think they can't do something because we're in this world and you know we're all equal and we're all the same and we all have, you know, sometimes people have, I guess some people have more opportunities than others, but I think anyone can do whatever they put their heart to.